Hello and welcome to the AgriLearn Podcast. I'm your host, Raina Nalao, an aspiring full-time farmer, as well as the brand ambassador for the Women and Youth Loan Scheme product at the Agricultural Bank of Namibia. Today, I'm joined by Mr. Hengs Sai Sai, who is a technical advisor at the Agricultural Bank of Namibia, specializing in crop production and poultry. Mr. Sai Sai, thank you for joining us. Uh, thank you so much for having me, ma'am. Our first question, what is the difference between agronomy and horticulture? Uh, thank you so much for the question, ma'am. Um, the difference is slightly a very small one. They are both branches of crop production, whereas agronomy mm -hmm. is the branch of crop production that involves uh, the production of field crops such as maize, sorghum and pearl millet, commonly known as mahangu in Namibia, mm -hmm. and soil management, whereas uh, Horticulture is the production of garden vegetables, fruit trees, and ornamental plants. So the difference is just that one is done on a large scale of land and one is done on an intensive small piece of land, whereas you do horticulture mm -hmm. in a very small environment with intense management and you do agronomy on large tracts of land mm -hmm. under rain-fed conditions and sometimes you do irrigation, which is the artificial application of water your crops but the other one now needs full-time irrigation so you don't do it under rain-fed conditions which is horticulture so let's talk about crop production what what is considered the best soil for crop production ideally the best soil for crop production is normally known as loam soil which has good aggregates between the aspect of sand and clay soil so you need to have at least 60% of the soil being clay and 40% being sand or the other way around. Mm -hmm. But for most farmers who are unfamiliar to this type of soil, an ideal type of soil would be a soil that allows good air circulation, good drainage, and has the ability to hold on to water for prolonged periods of time, making it available for the root zone of each crop that you are growing. Mm -hmm. So in the context of Namibia, I think, um, Ideally, sandy loam is one of the soils that are ideal. It has good drainage because of the uh, aspect of sand, and then it has air circulation that is an attribute of sand, mm -hmm. and then you have the attribute of good water retention capacity mm -hmm. that is slightly uh, influenced by the amount of organic matter that is in the soil. Mm -hmm. So that would be ideally the type of soil you would want to have when you're producing crops. How does a new farmer determine this type of soil? Okay, the easiest aspect that you can use as a new farmer is the soil texture aspect of the soil. So the fineness and the coarseness of the soil will tell you what type of soil you are having on your farm. So let's take for example you take a bit of soil and you rub it between the index and the thumb fingers and then if it gives you a rough coarse feeling like sugar particles then that tells you that the type of soil you have that is sand. So what are the characteristics of sand? Sand is a soil which is associated with good aeration because of the particle size and between the particles there are bigger spaces that allow free movement of air and water mm -hmm. but then the one attribute that is not good when it comes to sand soil is the aspect that because the spaces between the particles are big it influences uh, constant drainage of water so these soils have uh, poor water retention capacities mm -hmm. but this can be improved by incorporating uh, organic matter such as keto manure, compost heap mm -hmm. and other forms of fiber that you can be including in the, in the soil over time. Now with uh, clay Normally it feels like baking flour. Oh. So if you rub it between the thumb and the index finger, mm -hmm. it gives you a very fine feel. Mm -hmm. And then you know that this type of soil has very small particles. Mm -hmm. And because the particles are small, mm -hmm. it has high cohesion forces between the particles. Mm -hmm. So what that means is that whenever these particles are full of water, mm -hmm. it really takes a long period of time for this soil to allow water movement downwards. Mm -hmm. So in terms of fertility, sand has low fertility because water flows easily carrying away the nutrients from the root region but now in the space of clay clay has very tiny particles that allow water to move at a very slow pace so this uh, ensures that clay has high uh, nutrient content okay. but it's not 
quite user friendly for somebody who is involved in crop production because when it's dry it's hard to cultivate and when it's wet it becomes very sticky to your implements and sometimes it restricts uh, root growth mm -hmm. and sometimes when it's on the surface for a prolonged period of say three weeks it ends up suffocating all the crops you are growing in exception of rice. Mm -hmm. All right, wonderful, well explained. Now let's say a new farmer has identified the type of crops they want to grow and the type of soil they have. How then do they determine the depth at which they need to plant their crops? Okay, that is a very crucial question in the sense that when you're propagating or growing your vegetables from the seeds, the size of the seed has an influence on how deep that seed should be sown. So let's take an example of onions, cabbages, and uh, carrots. The seeds are small in size, so usually it's recommended that these small seeds are grown at uh, a depth of one centimeter. And then if you look at vegetables such as uh, Swiss chard, commonly known as spinach, mm -hmm. the size of the seed is medium. So for these type of seeds, you will need to, to sow them at a depth of at least two centimeters. Now for crops such as uh, maize, beans and cowpeas, mm -hmm. the size of the seed is slightly bigger. Mm -hmm. So these type of seeds have enough food reserves. And then normally the recommended sowing depth is about five centimeters in the soil. Mm -hmm. So that is quite crucial in crop production. So always remember, a small seed, you need one centimeter. Mm -hmm. The medium sized seeds, two centimeters deep, and the big seeds, five centimeters deep. Anything deeper than that, you'll find that you'll have crop failure because most seeds will run out of food reserves before their root system is established to start absorbing water containing some of the essential nutrients. Mm -hmm. Great stuff. Now let's talk about planting season. How can a farmer determine what time is best to plant their crops? That is a very crucial question in crop production. Mm -hmm. So always remember, Crops, they grow best in different environmental conditions. So you do have crops that uh, do well in uh, cooler weather. Mm -hmm. And these crops are crops such as cabbages, onions, carrots, and uh, beetroot. So they prefer the colder months of the year. So that's the right time to grow them. Mm -hmm. And then uh, crops such as uh, tomatoes, crops such as um, green peppers, eggplants, maize, Mahangu and sorghum and beans. These are some of the crops that prefer warm weather so you can grow them in summer. The easiest way for an upcoming farmer to grow these type of crops and to know which season is recommended is always to ensure that when you buy a packet of seeds, refer to the labeling at the back of that packet. It will tell you that during summer, winter, autumn, and spring mm -hmm. which season is ideal because they will always indicate a tick on the ideal season oh, at tick. which okay. yes <laughs> you should grow that specific uh, plant okay thank you now let's talk about the spacing what is considered the normal spacing between the crops okay when it comes to spacing it's uh, essential to know that the spacing that is recommended that is the area that allows each crop you are growing a space in which it gets the nutrients, the sunlight, and the air. So for vegetables or crops that have the ability to grow in a spreading manner such as watermelon, butternuts, cucumbers, these crops they need more spacing and they are recommended spacings are that between the rows you should have at least 150 centimeters and within plants growing in the same row at least 70 centimeters. Now when it comes to crops or vegetables that grow in an upward movement, you are normally ideally recommended to at least grow them in a spacing of between rows 40 centimeters and between plants within one row at least 30 centimeters. Mm. So when it comes to spacing, it is something that is quite crucial because if you know the recommended spacing of the type of crop you are growing, you can easily work out the number of crops you can grow in that given area. A question I wanted to follow up on. Okay. <laughs> but you may continue. <laughs> okay. So for instance, if you are given, three, uh, let's say, a seed bed which is three meters long mm -hmm. and one meter wide, yeah. the surface area for that space is uh, three square meters. Mm -hmm. So if the re recommended spacings are, let's say, for instance, 
uh, between rows it's 30 centimeters and within the row it's 25 centimeters mm -hmm. so you can do a plant population um, calculation where you say plant population is given by dividing the area mm -hmm. with uh, the measurements of the spacing between the rows multiplied by the spacing within a row so in that three square meters it's spacing uh, recommendations of 30 centimeters between the row and 25 centimeters within a row mm -hmm. you can grow about 40 plants if uh, my calculations are on point i'm sure they are <laughs> <laughs> all right let's uh, move on to the next question which are the most common vegetables in namibia and what are their suitable planting time okay so the most common uh, vegetables in Namibia, mm -hmm. remember before we get to the suitable vegetables, let's start by defining what a vegetable is. Please do. Uh, a vegetable is any crop that you grow mm -hmm. with a specific intention of harvesting and consuming only a specific part of that plant. So if only you are growing... a specific part of that plant. Yes. Okay. So if you are growing, for instance, spinach, uh -huh. you are only targeting to harvest the leaves of the crop. Oh. If you are growing tomatoes, it's only the fruit that is on that plant that is of importance to you. Yeah. So now the common crops are tomatoes, which normally are grown during the warm months of the year. Mm -hmm. And then you do have uh, onions, which people normally cultivate or uh, grow during the cooler months of the year. Mm -hmm. And then you have cabbage, which is also grown during the cooler months of the year. And during summer, you have vegetables such as um, butternuts, mm -hmm. watermelons, and uh, to some extent people are growing green peppers. So these are some of the common vegetables that we have within our local sector of vegetable production in Namibia. Wonderful. Let's talk about pests. A very common issue that farmers face. What are the most common pest issues that Namibian farmers face? And how can they mitigate those issues? Okay, when it comes to pests, Let's start with uh, some of the very problematic ones. Mm -hmm. We do have a common occurrence of uh, chewing pests. Mm -hmm. These include locusts, mm -hmm. these include fall armyworms, and normally these kind of pests occur in very large swamps, mm -hmm. and when they attack your crop field, they might end up causing extensive damage because they just feed on the leaves, on the stem, and every visible part of your crop. And in some cases, they might even end up chewing on your desired um, part of that crop. Yeah. And then we do have some very problematic uh, sucking pests such as aphids, which are found on the back surface of leaves. Mm -hmm. So you'll find that if you grow cabbages, for instance, yeah, yeah. at the back of the leaves, mm -hmm. you will have a lot of tiny uh, microorganisms that are slightly greenish or grayish in color that are just sucking sap or juice from the leaves. Mm -hmm. So they do cause serious damages and some of these pests can be controlled biologically by introducing a natural enemy to that specific uh, microorganism. In the case of um, the aphids, mm -hmm. the most common uh, biological control is the ladybird bug. Seriously? That tiny little beautiful uh, bug with uh, black spots on the back. Red and black spots, yes. Yeah, it's normally the natural enemy of aphids. In the case of um, in the case of locusts, sometimes chickens can help. But the problem with using chickens is that once they've finished eating the locusts. the locusts, they might now start going for your desired crop. Yeah. So you can still uh, control pests using chemicals, mm -hmm. but always ensure that when you are controlling um, pests using chemicals, mm -hmm. you have to know the direction of use or the mixture in terms of the medicine itself and water must be correct for it to be effective in controlling the pests, but always check the expiring date and you must have the right protective gear mm -hmm. before you go and spray the field and always ensure that you buy eco-friendly pesticides because if you buy pesticides that are not selective you might end up killing uh, useful insects such as bees, ladybird bugs, mm -hmm. praying mantis and all the other insects or uh, groups of uh, nematodes that are quite useful to you as a farmer. Let's move on to our last question. What hinders local producers 
into entering formal markets? Okay, that is a very crucial question for everybody who wants to be involved in crop production because each and everyone wants to make a living out of it. Yeah. So when it comes to the formal markets, when you want to sell to re resellers and wholesalers, for example, mm -hmm. there are two aspects that I demand from a producer. The first one is quantity in terms of how much can you supply to the market. And then the second one is consistency. How often can you deliver these quantities to the given market in order to satisfy their needs and for them to be able to satisfy the needs of their clients. Remember as a crop farmer that when you want to sell to ShopRite, ShopRite has a, a list of clientele that come in and out of the shop for specific commodities such as tomatoes, onions, and green peppers on a daily basis. So if you are offered a contract to supply them with, exam for example, um, 20 tons, or uh, let's say 20,000 cages yeah. of um, tomatoes, yeah. there shouldn't be a week or two where you tell them that, okay, I've run out of tomatoes, I can no longer give you tomatoes. So you will be classified as a risk because at the end of the day, they are in the business to satisfy the needs of their consumers on a daily basis. So your production should be aimed at ensuring that you have the quantity and you are able to deliver the quantity consistently for a given period for them to say that, okay, this specific farmer is not a risk but the moment you give them that snapshot of saying this week i cannot deliver then you are classified as a risk and then they would rather look elsewhere in terms of imports that are coming from an organized setup whereby every week or every two weeks they are being um, allowed to receive at least 20,000 cages of tomatoes and they distribute to their different outlets countrywide so once you have quantity and you do have the consistency to supply this quantity i think you can really benefit from the formal markets okay, wonderful thank you so much for having me on today's episode <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure thank you for making time All right. uh, to join us on the agrilearn podcast